At this point in time, everybody should have a GP SHTF rifle ready to go for when you're running out the door in the middle of an apocalyptic emergency. And this is the rifle I put together for that particular role. This will be my go-to rifle that when I open that gun safe, I know exactly what I gotta grab on my way out in a hurry. And I put it together and I thought by sharing everything that I did here, it might give the community some ideas about what you might wanna do with your SHTF GP rifle, but it also gives you an opportunity to give me some criticism or feedback down in the comments below about what you would have done differently differently or what you would change out just based on some of my selections. I don't have a lot of experience. I'm not prior military or prior law enforcement. I'm just a guy who shoots quite a bit and does a lot of research, but some of you have a lot more experience than I do and I appreciate learning from you. So. I do want to mention that the biggest supporter of the channel is Midway USA. And of course, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today can easily be found at Midway USA. So a big thanks to them, but I also have some things here from some niche, smaller manufacturers that are just very good products that we're also going to discuss. This is something I think is important. I think everybody should have that rifle they don't have to think about twice. You don't have to even think for a second which gun I'm grabbing when I run to that safe in the middle of an apocalyptic emergency. There is no other choice. And that's exactly what I try to put together here. So let's talk about the most important part of the SHGF GP rifle first, and then we'll move on to everything else thereafter. Obviously, one of the most important parts of your SHTF GP rifle is the rifle itself. So right here, we have a Wilson Combat Ranger in 5.56 NATO. Now, Full disclosure, Wilson Combat sent the upper to me upon my request as they are a friend of the channel, and I provided the lower to myself. So, big thanks to Wilson Combat. And why the Wilson Combat Ranger specifically? Well, obviously they have great QC, high quality components, and great customer service, but this thing runs. I've tested it, I've vetted it, it shoots really well, and I have zero issues depending on this rifle to save my life. But the main reason I wanted this particular upper is because it's very lightweight and it uses a tapered barrel made out of 416R stainless steel with a one and eight twist, which is basically a match grade barrel. And the reason you would want that is because it maintains higher levels of accuracy throughout the life of the barrel compared to something like a cold hammer forge barrel, which will have a longer barrel life, but will lose accuracy faster during the duration of that barrel life. So these are all considerations and trade-offs that we have to make. I'm just hoping I don't need to use that high of a round count post SHTF. Now, the barrel itself is 16 inches long and uses precision button rifling in order to maintain that accuracy, and it has an armor tough coating on it which protects it from the elements, while only weighing 25 ounces. It also had a Q-Comp muzzle device on the end, which was good at mitigating recoil and flash, but it had to go because I needed my suppressor here, but it was a good muzzle device in general. So I just wanted to mention that. I tested this upper in its original configuration before changing anything in order to make sure everything ran smoothly, which it most surely did. Now, it has an intermediate length gas system, 0 0.750 profile gas block, and then it has a 12.6 inch Wilson Combat handguard, which also saves some weight because it doesn't go the entire length of the barrel like many other handguards do. It's a forged upper receiver and has a nickel boron BCG or bolt carrier group. Nickel boron's good for this purpose because in an SHGF scenario, you might not be able to maintain your rifle as well as you usually can. And nickel boron cleans easily as well as maintains a higher level of lubricity. So, came with a mil-spec charging handle, Got rid of that and I swapped it out for a Radian SD, which is a Radian Raptor SD, I believe. It helps to mitigate some of the gas coming back in your face when you're running suppressed, and it's ambidextrous, so that was very helpful as well. Now, the lower is a 7075T6 billet Wilson Combat lower that has an oversized magwell, integral large trigger guard, which is good for wearing gloves, had a threaded bolt catch, which was easy for installation, and it has a rear takedown pin retention system that's installed through the pistol grip, which was much easier than the usual way you'd have to install a rear takedown pin. So keep that in mind. And then this is the B5 SOP Mod Enhanced Stock, which I really like. And then the trigger group in here is actually the Wilson Combat TTU M2, which is a two-stage mil-spec trigger that has a really nice four pound trigger pull on the back end. So a super nice trigger. And honestly, Wilson Combat isn't thought of a lot when it comes to AR components, or at least in my opinion, they're not. And they should be because their stuff is really good. And these triggers are awesome. And this isn't the only Wilson Combat trigger I have, but I can tell you that this TTU M2 is awesome and definitely worth the money, okay? Now, the pistol grip is the Wilson Combat Starburst BCM Gunfighter Grip, which is a reduced angle grip, which I just generally like. And the safety selector is a Radian Weapons Talon 4590 ambidextrous safety selector. So I like that because I set them to 45 degrees instead of 90. It makes throwing the safety a little bit faster and I just seem to like it better. So that's why I use those. On the end of the receiver here, I have a Troy OEM M4 end plate with QD sling mounts. And I like that because I actually like having my sling here. I do run slings on the end of my stock as well, but what I found is with longer rifles, especially like this one here with a 16 inch barrel, 
Uh, I like to have a little bit more tightness on the sling and it kind of gets it out of my way a little bit. It might be because I'm six foot three and lanky. Who knows? I just prefer this. All right. So all in all, this is just running a H2 buffer as well as a Wilson Combat flat buffer spring. The H2 buffer helps to tune the gas system when it comes to running suppressed and unsuppressed. And the flat Wilson Combat spring should last longer than your standard issue carbine buffer spring. This thing runs really well, and you have to vet your rifles before you can just start decking them out. You should go out and test fire them. I shot this one with only iron sights for quite a while, and I shot it in its original configuration just to make sure everything ran properly, and it did. So now I have no issues investing further into this rifle, which is what you have to do when you want all the capabilities that you can see attached to it right now. So now that we've gone over the rifle, all the specs, and why I chose this particular rifle, let's make it look a little bit more SHTF appropriate, AKA let's rattle can the crap out of it. All right, now that we got this rifle all painted up and ready for Minecraft, let's talk about the accessories because that's where decision making comes into play and it can be very difficult to decide on what accessories you actually want to run because there's so many good options. So these are what I chose and hopefully my ideas give you something to think about when you're building out your own SHTF GP rifle. And just as a quick tip, in case you didn't know, yes, Wilson Combat Rifles are very expensive because of their amazing QC and the materials that they use, but the components aren't very expensive. In fact, they're relatively affordable for the quality of materials and the quality of the parts. So if you're a builder, you can get your own Wilson Combat put together pretty affordably compared to a complete rifle. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. This is a quick little pro tip for you. First and foremost, let's talk about optics because optics are extremely important. Obviously, you need a way to aim the rifle, and I would say that's the number one accessory you need to start with. So when it came to optics, I wanted something that was durable, tested, and capable, and so I chose an ACOG. Now, this is actually the Trigicon ACOG TA11-D-100291, which is basically their 3.5X model as opposed to their usual 4X model. And the reason I went with that is because it has a much better eye relief, which allows for getting behind the optic to be a little bit easier, and it came with the M193 Chevron reticle. Now, the M193 Chevron reticle is specifically designed to work with M193 coming out of a 16 inch barreled AR, which is exactly what we have right here. And it has a BDC that helps you take that round all the way out to 800 meters and lets you range out to that distance as well. The reason I like it is because M193, although it's not the best ammunition choice there is, it's very plentiful. I use it as range ammunition all the time. I have lots of it. And M193 is something you could easily source after an SHTF scenario compared to something like your 77 grain OTMs or things of that nature. You can also use this reticle with other loadings. You just need to know what your holdovers are. So you can load this up with 45 grain varmint rounds all the way up to your 77 grain OTMs. You just need to know where your holdovers are, but in general, it's set up for that M193. And I felt like that was a good option for a civilian rifle because of how plentiful that ammunition is and how often I use it when training. So. This particular model has the red fiber optic on top, which I really like because it allows for good illumination during daylight situations, as well as low light scenarios. And then also has the tritium inside that lights up the reticle in low light or dark conditions. I went with that option over the LED, which is powered by a double A, because I wanted something that would last forever. And I don't have to worry about batteries in this optic at all. The fiber optic could technically break. The tritium would eventually die, but either way, I still have an etched reticle. So they're still usable in that situation. Um, you just don't have the illumination, which you don't necessarily always need. And it gives you a little bit more durability in the sense of avoiding electronics. So that's why I went with the fiber optic model as opposed to the new LED battery powered options. Now, this particular ACOG is sitting on a Bobro QD mount. The QD mount made by Bobro, which is sold by Trigicon, uh, was a choice I made because I wanted the option to remove the optic quickly if need be. Just in case there's a catastrophic failure, I wanna be able to take that optic off and switch over to backup iron sights, which we'll talk about here in a second. But that's why I went that route. When you go QD, you still wanna get something that's very well-tested and well-proven. And maybe a LaRue mount might actually be better than this Bobro mount, but this is the one that I ended up with. So, so far so good, no complaints. So there's no real reason for me to change it. I also have the TA66 ARD right here on the front, which is an anti-reflection device. And what that does is stops 
people from seeing the reflection of the sun on my lens from far distances. So if I'm trying to maintain a hidden position of concealment, I don't want to let everyone know where I am based on any type of reflection. And that could happen at night even when somebody's shining a white light in your direction, they could see the reflection off of that lens and that could give you away. So I do think that anti-reflection devices are a good idea for an SHTF general purpose rifle. Now, I also have an RMR piggybacked on top of this ACOG. And I think that that is pretty much what makes this whole package extremely viable. By itself, the ACOG can do quite a bit, but once you add that 1X option of a red dot sight on top, it really takes it to the next level. So this is the Trigicon RMR Type 2, which is a 3.25 MOA dot, and it uses a 2032 battery. So nothing too crazy, but that battery will last about four years. Now, the RMR is the most ruggedized red dot on the market, at least in the sense of a mini reflex sight. And there are some new models out that I think are good. I do think that having an enclosed emitter might be nice to have on top of the rifle as well. But when it comes to long-term durability and capability, it's really hard to beat the RMR. So I stuck with the RMR. And this particular one has the RM35 mount, which attaches right to the bosses on the TA-11. And then I have a 100 Concepts RMR hex cap anti-reflection device on it for the same exact reason I have an anti-reflection device on the ACOG itself. So that is the main primary optics package. Not to mention the RMR sitting on top like this is perfect for night vision shooting. It really is just the right height for that type of capacity. And what's very interesting about it is that even though I have optics that are on Unity risers or Unity fast mounts, this is still a better height for night vision and that's just been my experience. So I really appreciate having the RMR up here for that purpose. And this rifle is capable of being used with night vision because that is part of my preparedness plan at this point. So this optics package as a primary optics package also all in total with the mount, with the RMR and everything you see, weighs just a little bit over 19 ounces, which is really good because there's a lot of LPVOs and things out there that give you some of that extra magnification capability, but they come in starting at 22, 23 ounces, and that's without a mount. So this is still a relatively lightweight package as well, which is important when it comes to having to lug this rifle around in whatever austere environment you might end up in, okay? Now, backup iron sights. I do have Wilson Combat aluminum flip-up backup sights. And the reason I have them, there's the front sight and the rear sight, is because you never know. And if we're talking about long-term SHTF scenarios, iron sights will guarantee that they work. They really don't have any failure point other than breaking, which backup sights can break just as easily as primary optics can, but it's redundancy. So if the primary optic goes down, we still have the backup sights. If the backup sights go down, hopefully we still have the primary optic. If they all go down, things are really, really bad, and I guess it doesn't matter anymore anyway. But either way, I don't always run backup iron sights depending on the application of the rifle system that I'm using, but on this particular one, because it's meant for that full-on SHTF, leaving my home forever and never knowing where I'm going next kind of a situation, I think backup iron sights are a good idea. And the Wilson Combat Aluminum ones are actually really nice, especially because they are metal as opposed to polymer, and they're not that expensive either. So uh, those have worked well for me, and I did zero them, which is what you should do if you have backup iron sights. Please don't put backup iron sights on your gun and never zero them and never shoot with them just because it gives you peace of mind because at that point they're worthless anyway. So that's optics. That's how we aim. That's what I chose. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below as to how you think I did in the sense of choosing good optics. Do I think having more magnification might be beneficial? Yes, at certain points, but do I think that this gives me the best do all capability of having some magnification mixed with staying lightweight and maintaining an extremely robust amount of durability. Uh, yes, I think that accomplished that uh, goal pretty well. So let's move on to the next most important thing you need on your rifle, which is retention, AKA a sling. And so what I chose here is actually the T-Rex Arms T-Rex sling. And it's just a very basic sling, but I use these slings quite a bit. I have them on multiple rifles at this point. And honestly, I just don't have any complaints about them. They do exactly what I want them to do. Uh, they're comfortable. They have just the right amount of padding to where it gives you a little bit of reprieve without being bulky. And uh, I just like these sleeves, so, uh, or slings. They're not sleeves, they're slings. And I like them, I think they do the job, and that's what I use. So, um, but make sure you have a sling of some kind, of course, but the T-Rex sling is exactly what I'm using, and I think you would be happy if you bought one because there's really nothing to complain about there. Okay, this one's in Ranger Green, and they do come with a sling keeper here on the, that I have here on the forearm, or on the handguard, I guess is what I should probably call it. Uh, but 
basically what this is do doing for me is allows me to stow the sling away in a manner that keeps it out of the way in case I have the gun in like a backpack or a bag or something. It just allows it to be a little bit more organized and I can appreciate having that capability. So I keep the sling keeper right here on the handguard just in case. Now, the next thing that you're gonna want on a SHGF GP rifle, at least in my opinion, next most important accessory is gonna be a lighting system, okay? So, weapon mounted light, extremely important. Why? Because you need to have positive identification. Why? Because you're the good guy, not the bad guy. So, it's up to you to make sure you're only shooting at things that need to be shot at. And PID is very important. And for a lot of people out there, you'll hear, well, you have a light on the gun, they'll shoot at the light. At that point in time, that's not your biggest concern. Your biggest concern is dealing with the threat and making it happen right then and there. And you need to make sure what you're shooting at is what you need to shoot at. So you have that responsibility, bad guys don't. That's just how it works, sorry, but welcome to the party, right? Either way, understand that having a light is very important and that there are ways to mitigate some of those risks. So I chose a Surefire M640V weapon mounted light. Now the 640V is nice because it's their new pro series of scout lights. And what that does is it comes with a mount, which is low profile and allows it to swing in and out based on exactly where you want it to be because it's on a hinge. And I think that's really nice because you can cinch it up really close to the handguard, or you can ha have it kind of hang out a little bit if you need it to, to clear a suppressor or something like that. So I really like the new mounting system that these Surefires come with. Um, and so far they've worked for me and this is not the only one I own. So so far, so good. This one runs off of two CR123 batteries, which on high would give you about three hours of runtime, give or take, but that's just what the manufacturer says. Um, so far, I haven't really noticed that exact amount of time working, but I haven't ran this light steady for three hours either just to find out if it would work for that long or not. So in all reality, it does what it's supposed to do, and I'm not too worried about the battery time, but you can't run these lights all day long and expect them to maintain a battery life. This one is interesting because you have a big, M600 style scout light here, but it only has 350 lumens because it's a V, which means it's vampire, which means it has IR capability. So you're splitting the difference of having high lumen output with having the IR capability as well. And what's nice about that is that it allows you to use it in conjunction with night vision, which I told you this rifle is set up to be able to be used with. So not as many lumens, but still plenty because it still has good candela. I think the candela amount is around like 12,000, which is not bad. And what's great about that is that you still get a good tight focused beam, which can reach out. And that's really what matters almost more than the lumen output when it comes to using it on a rifle. So no complaints there and having the IR capability is nice. And one thing that's really cool about these particular lights is they also have an off mode. So if you're worried about accidentally discharging the light in a moment where you don't want to, you can actually spin the head to off and then you're good to go. So. The pressure switch I'm using on this particular light is the Surefire, uh, let's see, it's the DSSR07. It's hard to, it's hard to remember all those sometimes. DSSR07, which is a pressure switch also connected to a thumb cap switch. So what's nice about that is that even if the pressure switch goes down, I still have your standard thumb cap switch, which I find to be beneficial because we like to have redundancy. So it won't ruin this light being able to output lumens if the pressure pad goes down. I still have the ability to activate it. I found that to be pretty important on an SHGF rifle and that's why I went with that. And then I also am running the 100 Concepts small size light cap. And what's nice about that is that it allows me to cover the lens and it's not really to avoid accidental light, just accidental light discharges, especially because I'm over here using the vampire light, which I could turn it off if I needed to, but it's more to avoid the reflection of the lamp head because it reflects just as much as a scope or an optic well. And then by avoiding that reflection, it makes me a little bit more uh, concealed if somebody was shining a light in my direction, especially at nighttime. So that's why I'm using the 100 uh, Concepts light cap. It's mostly to avoid the reflection, but it would help during an unintentional light discharge as well. So, Here's something else related to illumination, but it's only going to work if you're concerned about things like night vision. And that is the Steiner D-Ball D2, which is a laser aiming module that's also an IR illuminator. And the reason I'm using this is because it gives you active night vision aiming capabilities, uh, and it is one of the better ones on the market for that exact role. So the D-Ball D2, really nice when it comes to active night vision aiming and active night vision illumination, uh, but it is heavy and it is large and it is expensive. So it uses one CR123 battery and it eats batteries like pretty fast. It's not gonna have a huge battery life. So this is a very temporary use item in case you're using night vision at night and you have to engage targets, 
now it's going to be used. Well, it also adds a lot of weight to the gun. So the way I have it set up is that it comes with a QD mount, which is great. And then the QD mount here has a lanyard attachment to it, which I used a piece of bungee to attach it to my QD mount on my sling in order to be able to remove it if need be, but maintain it if it were to break or fall off. And things do fall off and you should try to bungee your stuff. So I bungee this to the QD mount on my sling, which means I can just pop the QD mount off and then remove the laser aiming module. And what's nice about that is that I can then take it off for daytime so that the rifle maintains its lightweight nature and then put it on at night if needed. But I don't necessarily have to have it on the rifle. Uh, and I did learn that trick from a friend of mine named Chappie who actually works with Nightline Inc. And in case you guys need night vision stuff, make sure you check out Nightline Inc. Because if you go through the process of ordering through them, uh, not only will they walk you through everything and give you all the data and spec sheets and everything else that you need regarding night vision, but if you mention that Magic Prepper sent you, you'll get 15% off, which when it comes to night vision could be a huge chunk of change. So make Make sure you check out Nightlight Inc. Big thanks to Chappie for giving me this little hack here because by hooking the bungee um, or the lanyard to my QD mount, I can remove it easily, but it has some way to maintain uh, its connection to the rifle in case the QD mount were to break or something like that. So tethering is important, especially when it comes to things that are expensive and things that are out there and can take some abuse based on whatever happens to the gun. And I actually have the ACOG tethered as well using some paracord through the mount that then I have connected back here to this QD mount for the same exact reason, because I can pop the QD off and then I can remove the ACOG. So everything's very quick release in that sense, but it will keep the optic and the D-Ball D2 tethered to the rifle in case they break off. So mounts fail, it just happens. Uh, and this is how you maintain your equipment without losing it in a bog or who knows what else. So just something to keep in mind in case you're wanting to tether your stuff, there are ways to do it. And that's how I chose to do it. I would definitely kind of look into this whole using your QD mounts in order to do it because you know it's not permanent then, but it is something that uh, will still be there in case it was to fall off. Now, Let's move down to the muzzle because that is somewhat important. We want to make sure we don't give off too much of a signature and we don't want to give away our position, but we also want to have good capability. And I'm just being attacked by bees, by the way, this whole time. So I don't dislike bees. In fact, I like them quite a bit and I will be beekeeping at some point here in the future, but uh, I don't really want them all over my legs. Oh, well, it is what it is. So the muzzle device I'm using is actually the Silencer Co. ASR Flash Hider Suppressor Mount. And it does a great job. It's a three prong flash hider, but this one is actually the 30 cal one, which is still threaded for half by 28. And the reason that is, is because the 5.56 the five, one or the 2.23 one is never in stock. So I just went with the 30 cal and it works perfectly fine. It hasn't really changed when it comes to flash signature without the suppressor. And of course, with it, you don't notice it at all. And I do plan on running this gun pretty much 99% suppressed. So I wasn't too concerned about it. And so that is something you can do, but I would still suggest getting the correct size one if you're able to. It just never seems to be in stock. So I got the 30 cal, works just fine. And then the silencer or, or suppressor is actually the Silencer Co. Omega 300, which is a really nice can. It does a good job. Uh, it, the rapport is manageable. It's not very loud, even with 5.56. And uh, it allows me to use it on my 308, my 300 Blackout, my 5.56, and it just does what a suppressor is supposed to do. It mitigates signature and uh, allows me to hopefully not be seen as easily or not be heard as easily. So no complaints there, seems to run well, and it is QD, which I also like because I can take it off if it's too much weight, or if something happens, I need to get rid of it, no problem at all, ditch it, and I still have a flash hider underneath. Up here at the front, under the handguard, you also see that I have a BCM Mod 3 m Lock 4 grip, and that is just to kind of be more of a hand stop, but a good way to kind of get a good grip on the front of the gun without using a C-clamp, because I don't know why, but with my arms, that just doesn't seem to work very well. And the way I have this set up allows me to actuate my pressure pad for my light, as well as the uh, button here on the back of the D-Ball D2, and it places my hand in the same position every time, so I don't have to relearn any muscle memory. And I like it. It also works as a barricade stop. So to me, it just works. Maybe you don't like vertical foregrips. For a long time, I was using hand stops only because I was trying to get on the end of the gun a little bit better. But the more stuff you add in the sense of capability, the more things kind of evolve into a different direction based on your necessities. So keep that in mind. But those are the accessories on the gun. And we've already talked about everything else related to the gun itself, even when it comes to the pistol grip and the stock. So, um, that's what I'm running. Uh, Magpul P Mags, 
30 rounders and they are of course camouflage with the rifle and Magpul P mags just work. I don't really know what else to say about them. Do I have aluminum mags? Do I have other mags like Lancers? Yes, I do. But if I'm leaving my home forever and I only get to pick one type of magazine to bring with me, I'm just going to grab P mags because I just haven't had any issues with them at all. Uh, they're durable enough. And like I said, they run. So that's what I'm using here. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are on some of my equipment selection and just give me some ideas about anything else you might change or think differently about. I do have a suppressor cover that I can use here on the end of the Omega 300 to give it more camouflage as well as to mitigate any issues with heat. But the issue with the suppressor cover is that it weighs five ounces. It is a Coltac HTP. It does a really good job, but it weighs five more ounces. So that's five more ounces on the end of the gun. And that also means that the suppressor doesn't cool off as quickly either. So there's trade-offs there. And lately I just haven't been running it because that extra weight is just a lot to manage on the tip of the barrel when I already have a 14 ounce suppressor strapped to it. So anything else you guys, uh, Think I should change or you know any ideas you have or any questions you have about any of this gear selection let me know and then we'll go ahead and just talk about some final thoughts here and I'll give you my two cents as to uh, you know what I think about this rifle in general all in all, I think I put together a pretty capable rifle package here, and I feel pretty confident that this thing will get me through whatever SHTF might dish out at me during some kind of a apocalyptic scenario. But if there's things that you think you would change or do differently, please let me know in the comments below. I'm here to learn just as much as anybody else, and I appreciate the criticism in the sense of it being constructive. If you're just here to be a jerk, you can do that too. But honestly, I'm pretty confident with this rifle. I feel pretty good about it. I shoot it pretty well, and I think it can handle a lot of what would be thrown at it during that type of situation. If you need anything else from me, you can go to magicprepper.com. And besides that, that's going to be it for Magic Prepper.